All right, I'd love to be an icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what thing that uh, affected me in good way about Dharma is um, understanding this uh, mind of mine is really not mind of mine. It's uh, the point that it's understanding that this mind is always generating random thoughts and saying random things. And I used to think that I have to follow my heart, do whatever, what, do whatever my mind says, and, and listen to it. But when I came to Dharma, what the new thing that I, I learned is that this mind of ours is not necessarily, is always friend of ours. It says random thing, it says things, it's not about like following our heart. It's many of the times whatever it is saying, if I do that, actually, it, it will hurt, hurt me. So then I uh, started practicing and more than uh, immediately uh, immediately giving what my mind wants, I would rather like sit back and then watch whatever it is saying. Maybe it's asking like, no, 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 right now, I, I want a pizza or I want a McDonald's, whatever. And I would just like, sit back. Previously, I would just go and, oh, I, this is what I need, I'll just do that. But after coming to Dharma, I would just stay back and watch, like, see how, how long it, it asks for um, McDonald's or burger, whatever. And sure enough, like, the teaching of impermanence also, um, I can see in myself, like, after some time, maybe two, three seconds, it fades away and maybe something else comes, something else comes. So it has been like tremendous, um, tremendous thing for me as in practice, like understanding that my mind is just like a little child. It just keeps keeps saying different things. It's always a scared, afraid, no, wants this thing or that thing. I do not have to necessarily give give in to those things immediately. But if I can sit back and not try to control it and let it be whatever it is, and I see that it fades away and then I can come back to whatever wholesome thing that that I need to do. So it it has been a, of great benefit for me. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Okay, I've been coming here for over a year, so I feel like it's time for me to do this. Um, I'm going to share how I came to the Dhamma. So I am the daughter of two Italian immigrants, so I inherited Catholicism as my religion of practice up until high school, um, abandoned it because it really didn't resonate with me. It didn't fit with where I felt, I guess, my soul was calling to. And if my memory serves me right, I think my first exposure to Buddhist philosophy was in a class my sophomore year of college called Quest for Human Destiny, um, where they explored a lot of different religious philosophy or principles. And I remember hearing some of the guiding principles of Buddhism and was like, that makes a lot of sense to me. And this was back when Facebook still had the option to change your religion. <laughs> and I remember putting budding Buddhist in that category, but was not practicing seriously at the time. I think I was attaching to the label more than anything else. And went some time kind of just meandering, not really exploring anything. And in about, I think it was 2018, I was going through a relatively tough period in my life. I'd just gotten divorced and was a couple years into an eating disorder. Um, felt, feeling really isolated, it was a really dark time for me. And I remember, I don't remember what I searched in YouTube, but whatever search keyword I put in, Ajahn Brahm came up, uh, probably something about per perfectionism or anxiety or something, and started listening to him. He became part of my bedtime routine, actually. <laughs> where I just found a lot of refuge and solace in some of the things he was teaching about. And at the time, I was still living in the Chicago suburbs. I'm originally from there. And there wasn't, to my knowledge, a big um, monastery or community of practitioners out there, so I never really felt called to explore a sangha. But when I first moved here at the end of 2022, it was one of the first things I had this distinct calling to search for was a community of people who practiced Buddhism. And I remember thinking it has to be the same 
uh, lineage or philosophy that Ajahn Brahm teaches. Like that was in the back of my head. So I remember looking up what, what is the tradition that Ajahn Brahm is part of and it said Theravada. And then I looked, what's, is there a Theravada monastery in Seattle and Clear Mountain is what came up. And so I think what I'm trying to illustrate with this is um, Buddhism was always something that I think there was an intuition in me that was telling me this is what you're being called to. And it was never the thing that I inherited or felt like it was forced on me. It was something intrinsic in myself that was always finding some sort of solace or refuge from. And it just means a lot to me that in my transition and moving here, like one of the first things that was a cornerstone in my life was finding this community. So I'm really appreciative and grateful for that because transitions are hard. And um, it was definitely uh, something I found an anchor in uh, throughout my first year adjusting to new life here. So uh, hopefully that's inspiring to anyone else that's going through a similar period in their life. Hi. Is that working? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Hey, I'm Robert. Um, I've been coming here for a year and a half, so I also feel like it's time. Um, so how I came to Buddhism was um, about two years ago. Um, I kind of had a lot of internal suffering, kind of self-inflicted, really. Um, and externally, everything was fine. Like, I, if I look at, back at it now, like, I had a, a very, very happy marriage, um, good job, everything, really. But internally, I was, like, just dissatisfied sometimes. So, so what it was for me it was also, like, perfectionism. Um, so especially when I did something wrong, uh, or, or I did something, made a decision that maybe in, in retrospect was not optimal, like at work or other personal things. Um, I would recriminate myself a lot for it and, and, and would have this internal dialogue about it a lot. Um, and it was really kind of affecting just being in every day, like this would come up again and again. And it came to the point where it was kind of not healthy. Um, so I, I looked into meditation first, I'd heard of it. Um, started with the apps and, and all of that, um, and had a kind of inconsistent practice with that. Um, and then, a year and a half ago, I saw actually some of these flyers for Clear Mountain around Green Lake. Uh, so came here, um, started coming here regularly. Still had a very on and again and off again practice, so, so at times I would be very inspired by, by the talks here, and then had a, some better weeks, and then I would fall back into like old habits. Um, and then what, what really kind of changed it for me last year was um, first I was lucky to go and uh, um, to do the intro to meditation class with, uh, with Sims here. Um, was very lucky that my wife um, was willing to join that with me. Um, so that really helped uh, make the practice more regular. And then I um, also took off some time off work last year. Uh, to just kind of relax and, and also to go on a meditation retreat. So I went on a retreat um, uh, in the style of, or with a student of the Burmese teachers, Sayada Utejaniya. Some of you maybe have heard of his style. So the, the, um, the retreat was a lot about cultivating like natural awareness and, and, and just whatever came up, just being aware of it. Like even the meditation didn't go well or thoughts come up or something, just being aware of that and not kind of being too hard on yourself, just, just being aware of it and being okay with it. That really helped a lot. And then since then, I've had a much more regular practice. Um, and yeah, so, so what has meant to me is um, kind of now with this very regular practice, I, I just feel like I am very different, like if I compared to two years ago. Um, I, I, I gave up that, that kind of this habit of always like being dissatisfied or like, you know, um, getting vexations because things are not exactly as I want them to be. Like these days I can be much more, I think, with, um, with, with whatever is basically. It's, I mean, not always, but, but it, I think it's much easier for me to return to like a calm place and to be just present a lot of the times. Um, yeah. So. This really meant a lot, and this community has really helped a lot. Um, just coming here, um, seeing everybody, being with everybody, meditating, and, and the practice has really helped a lot. Um, so yeah, so, thank you. Um, begin with a message of gratitude. I'm so grateful to, to be here to meet the Sangha. 
uh, to meet you, Ajahn Nisabo, so I'm really excited. Um, uh, my answer is kind of uh, sort of one answer to both questions. Um, so, so I'd like to share that uh, with you. And I have a tendency to ramble, so I'll try to be succinct. Um, so for me, what brought me to the, to the Dhamma was actually addiction, but not in the context that uh, I guess it's uh, often used, which is physical substance abuse. Rather, my addiction was, was to the internet. So, which is um, very typical for adolescents, especially this generation and this day and age. Um, I was um, uh, badly addicted to, to video games, to social media, you know, you name it, the whole shebang. And so, long story short, I luckily, I was able to find my way out of that um, with many resources and um, help and friends along the way. Um, and simultaneously, during that time, I began to discover um, some of the Buddha Dharma. Now, my, my parents had been following Buddhism for um, at least 25, 30 years from that point, but it's, and they'd brought me to meditation retreats and introduced me to some things, but at that, when I was younger, it just didn't really resonate with me. It wasn't something that I felt was accessible. But after I started um, to really uh, delve into my relationship with craving, which is kind of what you have to do when you're addicted, um, I got very interested in these teachings. And so one teaching that I want to share, which has helped me in tandem with, with being able to go offline, which sometimes is to the, uh, my parents and my brother don't like it when I don't pick up the phone, but um, uh, something that's, that's really allowed my, my health and my uh, relationships and my life just generally to rebound and improve so much has been the doctrine of, of anatta, anathman, or no self. Um, which I found in my relationships and with my peers, uh, when we, we tend to get into arguments and um, conflicts and we'll cling to this, this sense of I, and it goes from you know, my perspective, your perspective, to I'm right, you're wrong, I'm good, you're bad. And you know, it's, it's not just our individual sense of self, so not just Samir, but our collective's delusions of self. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a US citizen, I'm a male, uh, I'm, um, I'm this political party, I'm Indian ethnicity, whatever it is. Um, and so I, I've been experiencing, and it's just such a radical experience to be able to have conversations and genuine dialogues with people where we're not sort of biased and disposed to one side and to really engage and sort of feel an intimacy um, and, and love with, the, with people like that. That's something new for me, to have that equanimity. Um, and and it, it's not something that I'd ever really experienced before I came. Uh, to Buddhism. So that's something that's been really powerful and impactful for me. Thank you. My name is David. I live in the in the Seattle area. Um, you know, as you're sharing the question, I realized that there are two dhammas. There's the dhamma of words and wisdom that is written down, and as some people say, there's the larger dhamma of what is ultimately true that's bigger than any dhamma. To steal from um, uh, Lao Tzu, the Dhamma that can be spoken is not the true Dhamma. And I feel like I've been coming back to the Dhamma for my entire life. And as I look very briefly at that course, and I've lived a while, so it's a long story, I won't bore you with <laughs> more, much of it, but from the time I was a little boy who loved nature to the one who uh, was raised in a church, didn't really buy the doctrine much, but I sure loved the music and the silence and the calm. Uh, to growing up, you know, as a, in the 60s and 70s, enough said about that. But I first realized I bumped into a book called Be Here Now by Ram Das. It was a big opening to a bigger world, you know, for me. And, and as was just mentioned, part of my story involves recovery from an addiction. That was a Dhamma to be learned quite a while ago. Um, I was part of a group that was a quasi-Christian cult, and although I've abandoned that long ago, the, there was Dhamma there, there was truth. There is truth in the 12 step group that I was part of. There is Dhamma in so many. The Dhamma is everywhere, and I feel much more like I'm coming back to the childlike understanding of the Dhamma that doesn't need to be spoken, almost like the story of the Buddha when he was sitting against the tree and everything was so lovely that he remember, remembered it. Where has it led? Um, this is another process to me and not a, an event. I don't think I ever 
came to the Dhamma in one sense. I certainly started attending uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's book way back in 1990s when it first came out. was really powerful, set me off on a quest to be interested in, in things like this. I would go to uh, the monastery. It was actually a Catholic monastery on the island where I lived in Hong Kong just to sit and reflect and meditate. Um, and it's funny because people say, are you a Buddhist? I say, no. And they say, well, you go to all these retreats, your entire bookshelf is lined with Buddhist literature, and you're listening to Dhamma talks all the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> I said, I don't know, but it's too much of a living thing to be an ist or an ism for me. I just choose not to identify with an ist or an ism and an ideology, but try to see what's true in this moment. And I, as I'm starting to write down some of these ways in which I feel like it's changing my life, and I think the word again is changing, it's all step by step, I have created a gratitude list here that without, without realizing it. Um, and these are things that are in process, they're not done, but I find them much less inclined to be clinging. Uh, this is not just in the last year, I think these are the products of years of practice and mistakes and deviation and so on. Um, selfing has re been reduced. This sense of me is not as solid as it used to be. My tendency to a lot, making a lot of effort and straining and stressing and trying to achieve is definitely blunted and softened. There's less me in the whole thing. Um, I notice I react less to things. My wife um, uh, inadvertently smashed the entire side of the car in a, a very badly designed parking garage. And when it came back, much to my surprise, I just felt, oh, Jen, that must have been terrifying. I never went to, you know, damn, the car is smashed. It's going to cost out. I didn't choose that. It just went away on its own, I think, as a result of being around the right peop wise people and trying to listen. I do find that I recover faster when something really does agitate me. It goes down more quickly. Um, overall, I just feel friendlier towards life and towards people and towards dogs and women and men and, you know, all kinds of things. So, and, and then I think another thing that's really been reduced is the need to be right, to have the answers. And I don't want to make it sound as if I've somehow achieved some state of, you know, enlightenment here, but I do feel that these things work step by step, and that's I think that's been the core message of the Dhamma, is that it's, it works step by step, it requires patience, um, it's counterintuitive sometime, and that if I try to get it right, or do it right, or push it harder, um, I, want, I want to be, you know, enlightened and kind now. Well, good luck with that. I'm going to go downhill <laughs> and not uphill uh, with that respect. So much, much goodness here. That's been almost five minutes. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to share. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I really want to appreciate the people who've already spoken because I just feel so much in common with many of the things they've said. Um, I'm just going to start with when I started really practicing uh, Buddhism because I think there was some interest there very early on that just didn't have the nourishment, um, but I, I uh, went on a trip with my family to Thailand and Cambodia in 2004, and we had uh, family members living there and uh, an old friend of mine, and uh, I took a book with me called Buddhism for Dummies, and uh, it was a perfect book for me. And, uh, but it was uh, a time in this country, the context was uh, the uh, Iraqi war had started recently in 2003, and there was a lot of just fear in, in the United States about terrorism, and uh, I remember my friend in Thailand saying, you know, who was born in the United States, I knew him from college, he was like, what's what's gone wrong in your country? <laughs> and, um, and it was, I think it was just meeting people who, uh, in a culture that uh, had Buddhism just very much integrated and just feeling people's ability to listen and there's kind of a certain acceptance 
that I felt and the imagery uh, around, you know, just walking around um, of the Buddha, all of that uh, was just really uh, spurred a lot of curiosity and uh, kind of inspiration. And so when I came back here, I was looking for a place where I could continue to explore that. And it took a few months, and uh, we went to a place in Ballard that was Tibetan, which, and I was going to these places with my wife. She reminded her too much of Catholicism, because there was a lot of ritual. And so she remembered uh, that one, a person that she knew from uh, her work on an ethics committee at Providence uh, Hospital, uh, Rodney Smith, who was, uh, ran the hospice program there, uh, was teaching Buddhism. And, um, and I really found that just felt like home, you know, coming to that. And, um, and I, I think what really brought me to Buddhism was probably uh, this uncomfortableness or terror about dying. <laughs> and there were a couple of people who had passed away within a short period of each other around that time in 2004 who were important people in my life, my mother-in-law and an old professor friend. And um, so it really highlighted the, uh, the reality of it. And uh, I started going to retreats um, once I started practicing with Sims and Rodney. And, um, and it just for the first time, there was this sort of opening up to things that made it less terrifying. And, um, and that... Uh, and then also just, I don't know, I just cried a lot. <laughs> and it was like just unburdening years of, of I don't know what, just, just was being shed. And um, it was joyful crying. <laughs> um, and so, um, and so anyway, I, I practiced with Rodney for, you know, till he retired and um, long enough that I could see sort of how practice waxes and wanes. And, um, and so during the pandemic, uh, I heard about Ajahn uh coming here, but I didn't, I didn't act on that uh, right away. I've been coming about, I'm in this group of year to year and a half uh, class who's talking today. Um, I heard about it through Peter Wortman uh, in our group, our KM group called Dharma Dudes. It's been getting together for about 15 years and uh, decided that, you know, I was ready to try something new and that the, um, the practice had kind of lost some momentum. And so it's been wonderful to come here. I see a, a lot of old friends from Sims and, uh, and feel the kind of inspiration uh, return. Very, very thankful for that. Thank you, uh, Janice Bo. And, uh, and thank you for all of you for being here. Cool. Hi, my name is Yamili. Um, this is my third time here. <laughs> um, I think I came to the practice, or the practice, um, the Dhamma, around um, 2020, um, quarantine, you know. Um, I came across a podcast, I don't know how, um, called Awaken the World with Michael Stone. And something about it was, it blended um, psychology with Buddhism, and they both just matched really well in a way that I could really just like grasp it, and it wasn't just grasp it, you know? <laughs> um, but things just kind of clicked and made sense, and um, things kind of opened up um, in a way that like I didn't want to cling to things or I could bring myself back, and my whole life I felt like there were two voices always combating each other, and that was the first time that I kind of noticed that there was someone far in the back just watching. 
And so when I noticed that, I started to kind of just push everything else in the foreground and take a back seat and just let things ride out. Um, and so I started my journey just kind of listening to those meditations and different meditations and Tara Brock and everything. Um, and it felt like a practice, but now um, that I'm letting go of certain addictions and attachments, I realize I was kind of just floating along with them. And I know that that's what I needed to kind of get to this point. But now that I've let go of some of those attachments, I'm very much realizing I need this and I need to be able to hold my breath. And so I've been waking up practicing for like 20 minutes in that same fashion and just holding that kind of intimacy and being able to look people in the eyes while still holding on to that breath, you know? Um, so I'm very grateful to be here and to see a room full of people just healing through everything um, that we may not have all these answers but once you have an idea of something and how it should be, that's kind of when you need to step back and reevaluate. And it's been very difficult and very hard, um, but I'm grateful to be here and I'm grateful just in general to be able to hold that kind of insight. Um, thank you for letting me share. Um, so I grew up in India, so the, all of these uh, different traditions are not new to me. Um, I've also spent some time in Dharamshala and different traditions, and um, so I kind of think about it as like I'm, you know, you go to a new city, you've got a hotel room, then you go wander, but you have home to come back to. So that's how the Dharma has always felt to me. I've always been able to return to it whether that's the Hindu Dharma or the Buddha Dharma, it's, for me, they're all, um, you know, refugees. But specifically here, um, I'm, I was at work last year, a lot of stress, a lot of anger, and it was one of those things, the familiarity of being able to say, whatever's happening is happening, but my suffering is optional. That literally was the sentence that came to me, and I was then um, said, okay, let me go look for retreats. Um, and Cloud Mountain Retreat, and Kate was co-teaching that, was uh, where I ended up. Um, it was, you know, it was terrifying. I've never been silent in my whole life. Five days of silence. Um, but it was one of the most easiest things, and they make it easy. The place is just amazing. And in my one-on-one -on -one session with Kate, I actually asked, where would I go to find Sangha in Seattle? And she recommended this, so very, very grateful. Thank you. Um, but that was back in November, and then you know I was traveling, uh, so I started coming. I want to say in January, um, and so this place has been. And 2024, my theme for my life was finding community. So whether it's at the Ballard Food Bank where I volunteer or here, so it's it's been really really good. In terms of the practice itself, it hasn't stuck as much as it should, but um, I've been learning more and working to build a more uh, structured practice. So hopefully that'll happen in time. Uh, but all I can do is keep trying. So this place has been wonderful in terms of finding community. I started volunteering thanks to Gary. Um, and there's more people that I knew than I realized, uh, people from before. So um, I've really enjoyed coming here. And um, I'm hoping that this energy makes me more prone to practice, so that's the goal. But thank you, Kate, for recommending and uh, for all of you to make this place such a welcoming. Yeah, I had the pleasure of meeting Ajahn Nisubo when he first came to uh, the States. I remember it was Election Day 2020, and to build Cascade Hermitage, which I'm sure you've all heard about, and I've become good friends with uh, Doug and Sarah, and with Ajahn Nisubo, if you can be a friend with a monk, I don't know. <laughs> I came, you know, and, I, and I'm a Zen practitioner, but I like coming here when I can, and, uh, and I attend online sometimes. And, um, and my story about coming to Buddhism, 
was in 1998 when I, when I got divorced. And there used to be in, in Redmond, Washington, where I lived at the time, a bookstore called the Stonehouse Bookstore. And it was run by this, somebody knows it, run by the Svendenborgians. And they had all the religious spectrum in there. And I ran across the book by Pema Chodron called When Things Fall Apart, which is so appropriate when you get divorced, right? And it was a great message because she said, that's the perfect opportunity to put things back together again. And so since then, so since 19, and I mean, I had some exposure to Buddhism when I was in graduate school. And, and immediately afterwards, too, when I attended a, uh, a Japanese Zen sitting group in Bellevue. But it was just sitting, there was no Dharma talk. And I said, well, what's going on? Why am I here? <laughs> so that didn't help a lot for, for somebody with a computer-like mind. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, been, it's been a great journey and uh, it really has helped straighten out a lot of things in my life. You know, I, I grew up not knowing that I was gay in a time when it was not a good thing to be gay in a, in a milieu and a location when that simply wasn't accepted. Um, and, and, you know, part of my coming out late in life and, you know, has to do with the self-realization that comes with practice and the acceptance. And Pema Chodron, I'll quote her again, she said, um, you can only be as compassionate to others as you are to yourself. And it took me a long time to learn that, but that, that's part of becoming who you are. And I think that's, you know, between friends and the Dharma, that's been sort of the story of my life, is finding out who I am. And it's never too late. <laughs> so thank you very much.